health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered, and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Langell. I'm the president of Northeast Ohio Medical University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the last Vitals of 2023. VITALS is an acronym representing value, innovation, technology, advocacy, leadership, and service. These are the tools that today's transformational leaders are using to initiate change to improve healthcare in the United States. I'm very pleased to bring you today's speaker, who has been an incredible innovator and leader in healthcare, Dr. Peter Pronovost. Dr. Pronovost is the Chief Quality and Clinical Transformation Officer and the Veal Distinguished Chair in Leadership and Clinical Transformation at University Hospitals. He is a world-renowned patient safety champion, physician executive, critical care physician, and a prolific researcher with more than 1,000 peer-reviewed publications. He is an innovator and thought leader who has founded several technology companies and informed US in global health policy. Dr. Pronovost's transformative work leveraging checklists to reduce central line associated bloodstream infections has saved thousands of lives and earned him national acclaim. His intervention has been implemented across the United States. And as a result, central line associated infections that used to kill as many people as breast or prostate cancer have been reduced by 80%. Dr. Pronovos has been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine and received the coveted MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. In 2022, Dr. Pronovos led the efforts that culminated in university hospitals winning the American Hospital Association's Quest for Quality Award, the industry's most prestigious honor, recognizing its member organizations for their commitment to quality. Along with the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Pronovos co-chaired the Healthcare Quality Summit, an initiative created in response to President Trump's White House executive order to modernize and improve quality measures for HHS, Veterans Affairs, and the Department of Defense. He also serves as a member of the President's Council for Science and Technology Patient Safety Working Group that is producing recommendations for improving patient safety to President Joe Biden. Dr. Pronovost is an advisor to the World Health Organization's World Alliance for Public Sa Patient Safety and regularly addresses the US Congress on patient safety issues and he is a strategic advisor to several healthcare companies and venture capital groups. He is known as one of the most influential executives and healthcare leaders, and is one of the top 25 innovators in healthcare. He has done an incredible amount, and I'm sure he can only share a small amount of this amazing history and work that he's done with us today. Before I turn this over to this amazing leader, I do want to recognize that we have one Zoom link joining us today that represents women in Neomed. Uh, there'll be about 25 members attending today. So uh, ladies, thank you for being here with us today. With that, Dr. Pronovost, the uh, the floor is yours. Dr. Langell, thank you so much uh, for that generous introduction. And I wish my daughter was here <laughs> listening to that. Uh, the biggest problem the world faces 
is our inability to solve complex problems collaboratively. Just look at healthcare. One in four patients are harmed. One in two suffer because they don't know how to care for themselves after discharge or they were disrespected. All but the very rich suffer from long months to get access to care. And if you're poor or if you're black, all of these outcomes are much worse. Labor productivity is negative. Costs are increasing. Payments are decreasing. Bankruptcies are going through the roof. 50% of hospitals have negative margins. And as a result, the very survival of not-for-profit healthcare that UH is a big part of this community and that has survived for 160 years is threatened. Yet it doesn't need to be that way. And here's the thing. The core reason for our inability to solve problems is a lack of love. Now, I know that probably sounds esoteric, so let me explain what love means to me. Love is an energy that uplifts and connects us all. Love is a force innately in each of us, and that means we matter. We are born worthy of having respect, of having agency, of having our voices heard. Love sees wisdom and the beauty in every person and invites their ideas to the table, regardless of their pedigree. Love is the absence of separation. Yet too often we other, we are separated. We look down on people. We think that we are smarter than them. So we develop top-down command and control solutions that never work. We say that if you don't work at the right hospital or that you don't have the right degree or title after your name, or you don't go to the right college or you don't dress the right way, or you stutter like I do, or your skin's not the right color, you don't have the right to correct ideas. Then your voice somehow counts less to such an extent that some people believe that they are less worthy and they don't speak up. We discount ideas, diminish the ability to debate for fear of being contempt or being canceled. And in doing so, we destroy progress and innovation. And people feel demeaned, demoralized, and have decreased energy. We destroy all of our ability to solve problems and diminish value for all. When we lead with love, the opposite happens. We believe in people that they're innately good. We respect, uplift, and unleash their brilliance. We feel we matter and that we feel we are valued and add value and thus support dialogue and encourage the free flow of ideas without fear. We see good ideas and effective solutions from wherever they may emerge. We focus on what works rather than who brings forth ideas. And love is strong enough for you to dislike someone's ideas, yet see their common humanity. When you leverage the power of love within and between people, you solve problems better, faster, cheaper. Learning and innovation flourish. And let me be clear, this is not some feel-good philosophy without accountability. For sure, it's more joyful. Yet love is the path to results. That's the leadership the world needs. It's the leadership that healthcare needs. My story is how I came to realize that and how we're infusing love at university hospitals. My origin story is the origin story of my worldview and my philosophy on healthcare. I was born the son of two orphans, yet we created a super strong family. I felt I mattered so I could question and discuss problems. My voice was heard. My parents empowered me and I felt significant, secure, and loved. Our family is small, yet devoted to each other. My interest in safety was forged from healthcare's failings. At the young age of 50, my father died after being misdiagnosed. He could have been saved by a bone marrow transplant. Yet by the time we got the correct diagnosis, it was too late. And I remember carrying his crumbling 80 pound body up to this bedroom with him writhing in pain. He suffered for a week. And during that time, a desire to improve healthcare was etched in my soul. When I was applying for med school, I experienced a pretty profound lack of love. Johns Hopkins was my top choice. And when I was interviewing, an older physician said to me, why should we admit you to Hopkins when you didn't go to an Ivy League college? I responded by a question to saying, do you have evidence that students from Ivy Leagues are better doctors? My GPO is 4.0, and you may discount that. But yet my MCATs are the top 99% in the country. 
So if you believe in objective tests, then I meet your standards. I was accepted and went on to be one of their top published and rewarded physicians in the school's history. And just prior to my fourth year of med school, my father died and I was not gonna able, be able to continue because I couldn't afford it. And that older physician waived my tuition. I will never forget his love. After I graduated, I did my residency fellowship and PhD at the Hopkins School of Public Health. And I was publishing and doing well, but I wasn't excited. I didn't have my purpose. My dad's experience made me want to improve things. That de desire ignited when Josie King died. Josie was an adorable 18 month old girl who looked hauntingly like my daughter and was born days apart. Josie died from a central line infection that led to sepsis and teamwork errors, all of which was preventable. And at the time, these infections killed more people than breast or prostate cancer. And we just accepted them as the cost of business. We accepted that when you care for sick people, little girls will die. Her mom, Sorrell, asked me if I could tell her that no other children would die the way Josie had. And I had a moral moment. I wanted to say yes, to tell her that all the great things we were doing to prevent harm. But I couldn't. Our infection rates were sky high and the whole countries were too. So I did the thing that love calls us to do. I told the truth. I said, no, I can't tell you today, but I will be able to tell you one day soon. That experience with Josie's mom sent me on a journey of rigor and accountability that became a career in keeping patients safer, improving value, and creating a new category of quality improvement research. That launched an effort to eliminate these infections first at Johns Hopkins, then in the state of Michigan, then state by state in the US, and then in eight additional countries. Now this was frightening. There was no playbook on how to eliminate harm in a country. We had to persuade five federal agencies, the American Hospital Association, state health departments and state hospital associations, and scores or hundreds of health systems in every state to work together when they had never had before. At the time, Health and Human Services measured these infections five different ways. And what worked was aligning around a common purpose, agreeing on a common goal, and connecting and unleashing all powers to eliminate, to innovate towards those goals. The lessons I learned through that experience is that love not only allows you to stand in your bright light, it also puts you under the spotlight. Love demands accountability. Accountability that first seeks other success rather than to punish, to support and inspire rather than to judge. The science of quality improvement at the time was not science at all. Indeed, the common mantra was that data was for quality improvement, not research, you know, as if the data know the difference. My view was that if I was going to be able to look Sorrell in the eye and publicly tell her that little girls like Josie would be less likely to die, we needed robust data. Yet at the time, no quality improvement collect study collected robust data. Indeed, they averaged over 80% missing data. We changed that. We required participating health systems to commit to less than 10% missing data, or they wouldn't be allowed to continue to participate. None of them dropped out, and 80% of the hospitals in the program went over a year without an infection. <clears throat> My roles at Johns Hopkins grew. I was a professor in the schools of medicine, public health, nursing, business, and engineering. I ran the ICUs, was the SVP for the system and quality, and founded the Armstrong Institute, a research group that brought together 18 different disciplines from every school in the university and became one of the most prominent quality and safety research groups in the world. And just before COVID, we left for Cleveland. My wife, Dr. Marlene Miller was appointed the chair of PEDS, the first woman chair at UH and the physician chief of Rainbow and Babies. And I joined university hospitals with the goal of creating a model for value. <clears throat> Our thesis, that is, if we use the framework of living and leading with love, we can transform care. And our model was very simple, a practical way to operationalize love. We call it believe, belong, build. And it's based on what's needed and what works in transformation. 
All employees must believe their job is to improve value, feel empowered to do so, and have a clear, inspiring vision of the future that is better because of their efforts and it's aligned with their values. We need structures and cultures so that people belong to a learning community, a network that supports the free flow of ideas from anywhere they emerge so we can share promising practices and innovate faster. And we need to build robust management and accountability systems. We applied these to keep people healthy at home instead of healing in hospital and made visible and eliminated defects in value in people's care. Now, you may think this is the soft stuff, but here's the thing. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's look at the results. Reducing annual medical care costs, excuse me, Medicare costs by 33% saving the Medicare program over $100 million and receiving $50 million in shared savings in this year alone. It was a third of our EBITDA at UH when just four years ago, it was less than a million. Reducing surgical length of stay from 6.2 days to 2.5, sepsis mortality by 70%, A1C for 1,000 patients by 1.5 points, reducing the cost of care for people with complex lives by $1,000, I mean, $10,000 a year while tripling their sense of well-being and belonging, reducing sentinel events by 70%, reducing system length of stay for the first time in our history. And yet these are just a sample of examples of scores of projects that all had breathtaking results this, with this model. Yet patients are still suffering harm and we're still riddled with waste. So join us on the journey of zero harm. Josie's mom had asked if other children would be less likely to die. At first, I couldn't tell her yes. Now we can. We achieved an 80% reduction of these infections that killed Josie across the entire United States, a problem the size of breast or prostate cancer, and by 70% in eight other culture, countries. Yet the culture changes were just as robust, dramatic, and enduring. Sorrell and I talked to hundreds of hospitals around the world and to scores of media outlets. This ignited a movement of patients whose loved ones had been harmed, forgiving and partnering with health systems to make things, make things better. We built teamwork and collaboration on clinical teams to ensure doctors used a patient safety checklist and as a partnership of accountability. We transparently shared results to hold health system leaders accountable for zero harm. The deeper lesson we learned is that it wasn't only the checklist that was the magic. It was a belief system changing. Clinicians began to believe that it's not inevitable that little girls are going to die. They believed in zero harm. And more importantly, they believed that they could work collaboratively to achieve that. They found and felt the power of love. Yet feel that same energy around zero harm when you walk around UH on the hospital wards, in the clinics, in our team meetings, and at our Tuesday clinical transformation call. When you live and lead with love, everything feels different. Problems seem less daunting. It's precious and it's a powerful gift. As a result of uh, these efforts, UH what we received recognition with winning the AHA Quest for Quality Award. Six reviewers stayed at UH for three days. And when they left, they said, we felt that transformative energy of love that you shared in the opening comments. We experienced all of your staff engaging in improving value and making personal I will statements. Our only question is, how do we spread this? You see, the biggest lie we accepted in healthcare is that we label harm as inevitable rather than preventable. We shrug our soldiers and say, things happen. And when you care for sick people, Little girls are going to die. Fathers are going to die. I refuse to believe that. These are not unsolvable problems, not in healthcare, not in the world. The capability is in every one of us if we just live and lead with love. Don't get overwhelmed by how daunting or nebulous this sounds. Start by simply reflecting on a time when you felt you mattered, empowered, and connected with people to solve problems. That playful energy that anything is possible is something most of us have experienced. Tap into it. You see, love is lived in micro moments of positive connection. So go make a micro moment. 
Here are a few of my favorites. Listen to a colleague who is suffering. Innovate with a colleague and create that uplifting, playful, puppy-like energy. Declare a goal of zero harm when working with the team. Pause for a moment when walking into a patient's room to create empathy and think, just like me, this person is a mom, a dad, a grandmother. Feel the energy when you debate ideas and then create a common purpose and path forward. Ask what you learned and how you could support a team when they fall short of its goals. Assume positive intent when you disagree with someone. Thank caregivers by name for improving value when, they, when you pass them. And when you're feeling overwhelmed that you've been tasked with an insurmountable goal, like eliminating infections in the U.S., take comfort in knowing that leading doesn't mean you have all the answers. It simply means you have the courage to ask questions, the clarity to convene the right people, and the commitment to see the task through. The answers to the problem dwell with the people. Believe in them. Love's other name is understanding. Without understanding, we cannot love. The most powerful micro moment you can create is to be humble, curious, and compassionate enough to deeply listen to the people around you, to learn from them, and thanks for helping you make the world a better place. I wanna share one final micro moment with you. Uh, my mom has advanced dementia and is in an assistant living facility and she doesn't recognize me or others anymore. Yet recently we had this beautiful micro moment when she did. We looked into each other's eyes and we connected. We felt deep, that deep love in our souls and wept tears of joy. The moment was fleeting, but the power of love was awe-inspiring. We face many challenges in healthcare and in the world. The power of love is that we all matter and are connected with all of our messiness and majesty. We can leverage that power of love within and between people to make the world a better place. All of us have experienced the pain of feeling unloved and the power from being loved. Imagine how much better the world would be if more of us live and lead with love. Someone has to believe in people and say, this is a problem, it's within my power to solve, and then go convene a group to improve it. That someone is you. My friends, go live and lead with love. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pronovost, for those very insightful words. I want to welcome all of our members today. We have uh, about 125 on Zoom, and I want to welcome everybody who's watching on Facebook Live. Uh, at this point, I want to let you know that if you have any questions for Dr. Pronovost, please put them in the Q&A. For those of you watching on Facebook, go ahead and put them in. Uh, Michael, our tech guy, is going to uh, forward them to me as well so I can ask these questions. But uh, and, 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 Monica, please call me Peter. There you go. Okay. All right. Um, well, Peter, I will ask you this question first, because, uh, you know, in this time, what we're seeing a lot of is a lack of accountability and a lot of, a lot of mistakes being made. And, you know, I think it's a frustration for a, a lot of people, especially in healthcare when accidents happen and there's no accountability. So what do you mean about shared accountability when that whole concept is sort of more focused toward punishment. Right. Yeah, M Monica, great, great question. And let me just, you know, frame it to you. I completely agree. I mean, accountability in health healthcare is almost non-existent. I mean, just, you know, so I run a large health system and there's evidence-based practices that we know work. But in most health systems across the country, whether a provider does or doesn't do that is kind of at their discretion. I mean, imagine having a pilot say, I'm going to choose not to use the checklist today just because I don't feel like it, right? I mean, and so we need to solve it. But you're spot on, Monica. Too often accountability has been, I point a finger at you and say, Monica, why are your results so bad? And I wash my hands of any responsibility, even though I may be the one who's withholding resources from you. So shared accountability in this living with and leading with love means very explicitly that in our health system, 
a senior leader could only hold a lower level leader accountable if they first hold themselves accountable to set that person or that team up to be successful. In other words, they're in it together. And that means that you know the goals and your roles. You have resources. We built an enabling infrastructure to make it easy to do the right thing. We supported a peer learning community and you get results reported transparently. And so it gets out of this us versus them and a we, and it's how we went you know, from transformative results. I'll give you an example, Monica. An annual wellness, and I know many of our Neomed grads uh, are well aware of this, is one of the most important things in population health and primary care. And there's great evidence that it works. Four years ago, 14% of our Medicare patients were getting it, you know, of 14% of, of like 125,000. We implemented this living and leading with love. Today, we're up to 80%. And in the beginning, there were of our 500 primary care docs, there were probably 420 that weren't at our goal. Now there's two, right? And it was ratcheting up. If you didn't meet it, you, you would get a message to say, Monica, all your peers are doing well. Here's the toolkit for you to do well, you know, do these things. If you didn't improve, you got a little escalation of accountability. Monica, I sent you this memo. Doesn't look like you're moving. Let's plan to meet so I could see what your plan is. Please bring it in writing to me so we can see what your goals are. Didn't improve. Monica, we're going to have to set a corrective action plan because it looks like you're not performing. This hurts patients if you don't do this. It's a goal of our health system. Let's put you in a corrective action plan. And literally that and went from... 450 people not performing through those escalation to one. And, but it was all, I'm here to support you, Monica. This is a shared accountability, but opting out isn't an answer. N no longer acceptable in our health system. Okay. So I'm quite curious about what did you learn from the pandemic crisis when it came to the protocols that you adhere to? And did anything change uh, because of the pandemic and then the subsequent loss of people in healthcare? Wow. Okay. That's like a, a whole uh, talk in and of itself, Monica. That's uh, I guess why you're the senior correspondent for or healthcare correspondent for channel three. So, I mean, the pandemic was, uh, transformative in many ways. Uh, one really important way was healthcare learned to innovate and to fail fast. I mean, we had no choice but to do it. And, you know, healthcare systems are really bureaucratic and it could take years to get a, approval of a protocol. And um, we innovated fast. We also learned, Monica, that we need much more effective ways in communicating. You know, UH is a huge system. We have 23 hospitals. We have like 60 primary care sites. And sending out an email is in no way an effective means to make sure everyone knows about it. And so we tapped into these what we call fractal structures of literally just cascading teams to make sure people know about it. We also learned about the devastating impact of the pandemic in our employees and burnout and many people leaving the bedside and how it's so important that our communications are both empathic and hopeful. Meaning, you know, if you're just rah-rah and you're not acknowledging the suffering that is very real, people just don't trust you anymore. And so this balance of, you know, yes, Monica, I get it. it's horrible right now. We're all suffering. I'm suffering. Uh, but we see a better tomorrow and here's why and here's how we're going to get there. Um, interestingly, Monica, we had some of our worst staffing crisis after the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic was bad, but we were running around. But after the pandemic, you know, we had this immense shortage of nurses, but but other staff too, especially in hospitals. Many just said, I don't want to work in that risky environment. I want to go to home health. I want to go to insurance companies. I want to go into ambulatory. And so health systems were uh, stuck with paying for very expensive traveling nurses. You know, many private equity companies came and started these and they were charging four or so times the rate that we were paying. Just, just to give you an example, Monica, at university hospitals, we went from paying about maybe two million a year for what we call agency nurses or traveling nurses to 180 million, right? With no change in our 
payment, right? And so that was all costs that we had to absorb, our health systems in America absorbed. And it's, you know, why I mentioned so many are going bankrupt and 50% have negative uh, margins because we had to absorb this just exorbitant expense. The same thing came with supply costs. And so now what we're seeing is a just an incredible effort to get productivity higher and get cost structures down so that we could have, you know, some positive margins so that we could sustain these health systems for the long run. So one of our participants has a question and a comment. Um, Elliot says, I love the boldness and clarity and repeat of message to live and lead with love. It sounds trivial, but exceptionally powerful. How have you more effectively addressed pushback from organizations or individuals? How can we join you and encourage more to essentially get on the bus? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, great uh, question, Elliot, and uh, really insightful. You know, let me just share with you, the first time we introduced, or I introduced these concepts at, 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 even at UH or at national meetings, like the reaction is, was like a little bristling, or as you said, like, okay, what is this, like, is this hokey? And, uh, but then when I say, okay, like, watch the results. And, you know, when we started with at UH, it just, um, caught on by some others were quizzic were in, in quizzical but one of the ways that we spread it Elliot is we have a Tuesday morning clinical transformation call um you're welcome to join if any of you are interested and it's open and it's all talking about how are we living and leading with love and getting results uh we alternate weeks one week's ambulatory one week's in the hospital and that meeting went from like 30 people not sharing to um now having like 200 people religiously intend raking silos, they're seeing the magic of leaving, living and leading with love and they're seeing results. And it's just snowballing to the point that I mentioned the AHA now said, could you spread it? We're partnering with some consulting companies to have them offer this to other health systems. And there's, and, and it's not just limited to healthcare. This is you know essentially used in, in many other, other businesses. So I think everyone has to say, you know, how are we bringing this living and leading with love to our own lives and then to spread it? But Elliot, what's probably most important is it's besides the impact, it's just more joyful with everyone. I mean, like, but there's enough people going around gramp grampy or thinking you're a jerk or I'm a jerk and yelling at, and like, you, like, it's not effective solving problems and you're making yourself miserable and others miserable. Like who the hell wants to live like that? Uh, another attendee asks, how do you think value-based care reimbursement will change health care? And what is UH doing to prepare for a possible change? Yeah, so it already has changed uh, health care, and that will only uh, accelerate. So let me share with you, UH, we care for about 1.4 million people a year. And 700 of those, 700,000 are in an ACO. So about half where we have some incentive to improve value. And we've built a ton of capabilities to improve value that um, are driving real results. And, and let me give you an example. Uh, when we look at managing chronic diseases, the old model is they're cared for by a specialist. You might have a six month wait to get into them, and they don't really have the other infrastructure that meets patients' needs for behavioral health, for social needs. So we created what we call these systems of excellence, and we flipped it and say, 90% of care will be managed by primary care, and we'll organize it around patients' needs and, and around primary care. So the primary care docs and the specialist co-created checklist for if a complicated diabetes person patient shows up, what do I do? Or a heart failure? Because as you probably know, the medicines for these diseases have just exploded in the last five years and it's unrealistic. Everyone's going to remember how to do those. So, and then so rather than saying, okay, specialist, you're going to manage the patients for long term, we want you to set up short-term consults one to two times just to confirm the diagnosis is right and the treatment plan is correct for primary care. We then went on to do even a further innovation where our endocrinologist said, you know, Peter, I love this model and I'm wasting my time seeing patients in my clinic. Most of them don't need to be there, but I'm not getting to the complex patients. 
So we supported some of her time. And now what she does is screens uncontrolled diabetics. And if they're uncontrolled, it takes her four minutes a patient. She messages the primary care to say, hey, you may want to change this medicine. You may want to refer to a diabetic educator. You may want to go to the nutritionist. And that intervention is the earlier result I mentioned. A thousand diabetic patients who are uncontrolled drop their A1C by 1.5 points, the largest population health study to date. And we have that for heart failure, for diabetes. But let me give you even a, a different example. You know, if you look at managing chronic diseases, one of the things that we recognize is we are swimming in defects in value, or patients are, but they're invisible. Like, for example, the government CMS has, is your A1C controlled for manage a measure of diabetes? But let's just take diabetes. We have this for every chronic disease. If I look at defects in value of managing a chronic disease, there's am I diagnosed? Because we know half of patients with chronic disease aren't diagnosed, at least half. Am I on the right medicines? Around the country today, it's about 8 to 15% of patients are on the right medicines. Same for diabetes, same for COPD, same for COPD, same for heart failure. Is my physiology uh, and symptoms controlled? Again, diabetics, about 11% have their A1C, their blood pressure, and le le cholesterol control. Have you screened for behavioral health and social needs and then referred? It's about 2% are screened. It's about 50% who have needs, and it's about 3% are actually referred. And have I re avoided needless hospitalizations and ED visits? And it's all, that's how we took a third of Medicare costs out, was making these defects visible and unleashing all of our clinicians to design them out of the system. Here's another question from one of our attendees. How does one, how does one balance loving their patients without getting too emotionally attached? Woof, 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 woof. Good, good question. Um, and uh, let me just say that as you probably could attune, this concept of living and leading with love uh, isn't new. It's been around for thousands of years and it's in every great religious and spiritual tradition, right? Whether it's any of a Eastern religions, Western religions, spiritual people, um, atheists, Native American, this concept that people are innately good is in every one of us. But there's risk burnout if you're just empathic. That is, if I'm seeing suffering every day and every day, and I'm connecting to that suffering, then I get morally wounded. And there's pretty compelling data that you can't survive in that area. What's beautiful about this living and leading with love, it's based upon compassion more than empathy. Meaning empathy is, do I feel your suffering? Compassion is, am I doing something about it? And that activity step is what gives you energy, what gives me energy and allows you to see suffering every day, but take comfort in to know that in whatever way possible, I'm doing something to mitigate it. And I think empathy in, the, in healthcare without compassion if not, I think there's evidence is pretty risky. And so the activity part or the activation part of this is really essential, but really insightful question. Another question from John, your impact through a focus on both quality and value has been amazing. Yet many studies have shown poor adoption of data proven best practices by healthcare practitioners like beta blocker continuation during a parasurgical period and appropriate DVT prophylaxis. So what do you see as the biggest reason for this and how do we overcome this challenge to support wide adoption of proven life-saving practices? Yeah, John, really, really key uh, question. And our Believe, Belong, Build is exactly the transformation model that we're using at UH to address that. And it's how we got those results. So let me get um, clear. First, believing. every In this case, the example was about providers. So I'll just use that. Your job is to improve value and you are responsible for doing so, right? As opposed to thinking, I'm a doc, I do whatever the heck I want to do and that's my decision. It, well, if you're employed by us, absolutely not. Like you, you're, there is what we say is we want to get rid of mindless variation. That's mindless variation just because you want to. 
and we build up um, or reduce mindful, I mean, mindless variation, that's variation simply because eh, I, I don't care about it. We build learning systems so you can see what your peers are doing. But most importantly, we have discipline management systems where if we have a goal, so say DBT prophylaxis is one of those, beta blockers is one of those, and we set a goal, typically around 90%, because there might be some exceptions, you get feedback on your goal, and we work together to ensure that you have those goals. And if you don't, you enter into some corrective action plan after a period of support, in this case, an FPPE, to ensure that your practice is consistent with best practices. But John, around the country, there is virtually no accountability for ensuring those things happen. And it's why a lot of harm happens. And we think this approach needs to scale because love, as I said in the beginning, isn't this squishy thing. I mean, it is you, if you excel, you're, you got the spotlight, but you're also under the bright light to say results matter and standards matter. And it will adhere to them um, unless we have a good evidence-based reason why not to. Another attendee asks, how do you balance the pursuit of high quality care with the need for cost effectiveness? And can you provide examples of initiatives that have achieved the balance? Yeah, so great, great um, question. L let me just break this up into like quadrants. You know, so if you say value or cost effectiveness is um, quality over cost, there's some things that are clearly higher quality but they may cost more, right? So take a look at the new Wagovi or the weight loss drugs, right? Or the new um, FDA approved sickle cell uh, gene therapy, that's $2.2 million, really expensive, um, but quality is much better. There's a whole lot of things that fall into the, they're better quality and we waste money. So let me give you an example. Virtually every complication that a patient has doubles or triples the average cost of care. Let me just repeat that. Doubles or triples. So you get one of these infections, you double your cost of care. You get a DVT, 2.5 cost of care. You And the uh, ambulatory, if you have a chronic disease and behavioral health, 2.5 times the cost of care. And so the idea is you could save a ton of money by giving higher quality of care and uh, giving better value care. Indeed, at UH, we explicitly have a strategy that is novel, but allows us to win in fee for service because we're still paid that, and win in value, and win in uh, meeting our community's need for access to care. And it's quite simply, we get rid of defects in value wherever they am. So in the hospital, long length of stay is a defect. Uh, you heard me mention surgical length of stay. You heard me mention complications. We also really rigorously keep medical admissions out of the hospital and out of the ED. Why? Because about 70% of general medical admissions do not need to be in the hospital if we had care in the ambulatory setting. So we schedule people from care from the ED or from primary care. We get them specialty care if they need to uh, within the same day. All that freed up hospitalization flows to shared savings and then more importantly, though, it frees capacity in our hospitals to get people who truly need to be in the hospital to get the care they need. Another attendee asked, transforming an or organization often requires a cultural shift. How do you measure and assess the success of cultural changes within the hospital? And what indicators suggest that the desired transformation is taking place? Yes, yeah, so a really insightful question. I may rephrase that and say it not it doesn't sometimes cause, cause a culture change. It always requires a culture change because if, if you're not transforming, if you're not getting at, at, at that deep level. And, you know, and many people throw this buzzword around transformation without having any idea, okay, well, what's the next step or what do I do? You know, our model of transformation is this believe, belong, build. And it was a radical, radical transformation change. I would say, you know, about five years ago, the culture at UH was largely to meet your budget and for physicians to meet their RVUs, which is their productivity measures. And if we did that, we were good. You know, we radically changed healthcare to say, no, no, 
Our goal is to keep people healthy at home, not healing in hospital, right? I mean, imagine that statement when we're still paid by people being in the hospital. And, you know, I'll never forget early on in this journey, I shared the story of Helen. Helen is a 65-year-old woman who was hospitalized with heart failure 15 times in the last year uh, at our health system and 13 times to the ED, all for health failure. What we missed was that every one of those admissions was triggered either because she had anxiety that wasn't recognized and diagnosed, or she didn't go to her appointments because her daughter had died of a narcotic overdose. Like so many people in Northeast Ohio, she was caring for her disabled granddaughter and didn't have respite care. But if you looked at our PL statements, every one of those admissions was counted as a good thing. We, we were paid for them, right? We, we had some penalty, but we were still paid and we were they were invisible. Nobody called out and said, Helen, is it the care she got is a defect. She shouldn't be admitted. We should diagnose her anxiety. And we started calling that out and says, does anybody think that being admitted 15 times is something we should be rewarding for or count as a good in our financial statements? And of course, people said no. And we said, you know, were we founded to fill our hospitals? Of course not. We were founded to meet the community needs or the health needs of our community. Okay, then let's start measuring and reporting on how well we're doing that. And let's make the care that Helen had obsolete. Another question from our attendee that sort of kind of jumps on the back of that. How is UH restructuring its approach to healthcare to ensure it keeps and meets patients where they are in the community? And can you provide specific examples of initiatives or changes aimed at enhancing accessibility and delivering healthcare services directly to the community? Yes. Yeah, so great, great um, question. And let, let me just unpack that because so often people use the term the community or population health uh, without being really clear what they mean. And we're often talked past each other. So when, when at UH, we uh, believe we care for four distinct populations, or you can say four communities, and we have varying data and levers to improve their care. Uh, the first is those we employ. We have 34,000 people we employ, we're self-insured, and we have huge responsibility to keep them healthy. Second is those we care for in our system on the fee-for-service model. We have responsibility for them, but we have really limited longitudinal data on the fee-for-service side, so we don't uh, often know how well we're improving their health. Third is those we insure, and that is people in our ACO where we have great data, we have longitudinal programs to keep them healthy. And then the fourth is those we live with. So those are people in the community who don't have a medical record or aren't connected with UH, but we have a responsibility to do that. Let me give you examples of the last two. Um, we launched a program uh, that the pilot was funded by Robert Wood Johnson, but now it's scaled for caring for people with complex lives. And what we mean by complex lives is they have medical complexity, so often five or more chronic diseases some social complexity, so they may be homeless or they have a domestic violence, and often behavioral health complexity. I might have a substance use, I may, may have other behavioral health issues, and they're really expensive. And to date, nothing has really worked for them. In our belief was because the current models were largely transactional and reactive. Like even if you read that Camden Coalition study that was a, a negative trial, they saw these people three times. We said if they had care that was living and leading with love, we could have a big impact on their lives. And what does that mean? Well, we mean that they had a care manager who didn't have 250 patients. They had 25, just like this model exists for schizophrenia. They first built trust and, and made sure these people know that they believed in them, that they saw them as worthly. They went to appointments with these people and made sure they were connected. And so rather than seeing them three times, they saw them four times a month for a year. And what did they do? They reduced their cost by $10,000. They tripled their quality of life. 
And I'll tell you this great story about this engagement. One of the gentlemen in the group was homeless and the care manager was trying to connect with him to go with him to get into a homeless shelter. And he wasn't responding to her calls and she, and he was acting engaged and he's, you know, kind of was more into his health and she, she was surprised. And so she called him, I'll say, you know, call him Jim and said, Jim, why are you not, you know, going with me to your, to get a shelter? You're homeless. You don't want to be there. And Jim said, my life changed. I have worth now. I don't want you to find me a damn place in a homeless shelter. I want you to get me a job. So take me to a job fair or get me a suit so I can go get a job and I can buy a house and be out of a shelter, right? It's that kind of transformation. We're doing a lot of things also in the community at large, you know, which is those we live with. So we have uh, the Rainbow Center that is for mothers and children where pregnant moms come in, they can get free legal care, they get dental care, they get eye care, they get medical care. We support um, birthing groups where moms talk to each other. We have uh, food for life pantries where we have food pantries in the community, some in Glenville and a variety of other places. Our ACO partnered with the Medicaid programs where we go into housing projects and go do health fairs where we uh, and connect them and access them to schedule health or to get Medicaid so that they could get, get care wherever they want. Where, where we're going now, though, is I'll share with you a really insightful question. All of these efforts to date have been supply driven, meaning we set up a clinic, but we don't really know the demand. And that's because the data from community health assessments are really poor. They're they're based on surveys of a small number of people, but they don't have patient level data. One of the most exciting innovations that we're doing now is our ACO data does have patient level data. And at least in Northeast Ohio, we have enough density that when we're partnering with, in this case, the Lake Health Departments, but we'll do it for all of the counties to marry our patient level data with their demographic data on the counties so we can get detailed disease incidence and prevalence data so that rather than us doing supply-based, we could do demand-based and say, there is a need for this amount of primary care or this amount of diabetes care in this, and we can design more holistic solutions to meet the needs of our community. Craig says, in our current healthcare culture, hospitals spend a significant amount of time and money pursuing recognition from outside bodies, example, U.S. News and World Report, instead of seeing the value of recognition from those for whom we care. If organizations do care about those being helped, why don't we hear those stories more? How can we overcome this disconnect and help everyone hear more about the good work healthcare workers are doing and the positive impact it's having on the lives of our patients and each other? And Peter, before you answer that, Craig, you need to watch Channel 3 because that's my job. Just saying. Go ahead. And Monica, I'll give you a, a shout out and you do it exceedingly well and capture some brilliant stories. So um, thank you for all you do. Yeah, Craig, really um, so many facets of that question you ask and and I'll share with you at least how we're approaching it and in, in uh, UH. First on the leadership perspective, external goals are so much less motivating to staff than internal goals, right? And for, for us at UH, cancer is the enemy, right? Suffering is the enemy. Harm is the enemy. And we ruthlessly drive to get to zero harm. And we share those internal uh, drivers to get there. On the flip side, you know, some consumers do use these external benchmarks to select healthcare. And indeed, many use US News Report or, or LeapFrog. The measures in many of them aren't often very good, but some of them do have signals, but unfortunately the measures are also like 18 months old. And so we try to find the balance where our number one goal is internal, uh, but we can't ignore those external benchmarks, uh, both because the public act on them and they look, look to them as a place of trust and they probably overweigh how good they are, but we're also paid by many of those measures. And so what we try to do is find the balance but as you said, what motivates our staff is not that, oh, look, US News ranked us this or LeapFrog ranked us that, is let me share you how we reduce sepsis mortality by 70%, right? Or here's 
this one nursing floor went a year without infections and let them tell their story. Carmen wants to know your thoughts on whether or not adding health and wellness coaches as part of the team in the community could help with preventing hospitalizations. Damn, this, this group is so precocious and looking forward. Uh, we have just launched that program, Carmen, so spot on. And you let me just share with you a, a, an effort that we're doing at UH that I'm really, really excited about. If you look at kind of the evolution of value in healthcare, there's almost like three errors. There's the complication in the hospital error. That's like the checklist that I you heard me talk about of infections. There's now like the value or population health where it's more focused on value and ambulatory care and keeping people out of the hospital, but they still have chronic disease. And the new version, the new future is, is wellness and well-being. Why is that? Because we know somewhere between 60 to 80% of our health outcomes are determined by our health habits. And that doesn't mean it's not harder for some people to practice those. If I live in a food desert, having a healthy food habit is really, really hard and I have to solve for that. But that living in a food desert doesn't negate that if you ate healthy food, you would, you know, you would be healthier. Or if you exercised, that you I mean these behaviors are crystal clear. Second thing is, Carmen, we know exactly what health habits keep you healthy. In our program, we call it the five pillars of well-being: nourish the dose of healthy food, move the dose of exercise, refresh the dose of sleep and stress reduction, connect the dose of social connections, and prevent the dose of well care. And so we are on a journey at UH with a very simple goal. We want our well care system to be as healthy as our sick care system, because the U.S. has a sick care system and we've underinvested in well care. And so CMS now allows health coaches to to bill. And so we are training wellness ambassadors and, uh, and health coaches. They're also training them or we're training them in the basics of behavioral and mental health because many earlier low risk behavioral health doesn't need a psychiatrist. It could be someone who talks about resiliency and anxiety reduction. And we see this as the future where when you go into primary care, you will spend more time talking about those five pillars of well-being. may not be with the physician, but it will be with the health coach who in our case is using appreciative inquiry and the state of the science, the science of behavioral change to help people live healthier lives. We have one question left and considering we're going into the holiday break, you and I were talking about this a little earlier and I never got the answer. So you mentioned that uh, Taylor Swift and Buddy the Elf provide evidence for your model of transformation. Can you please explain that? I sure could, Monica. And they're probably the most strong evidence. So let's take Taylor Swift and then we'll go to but, but Buddy the Elf because we may even be get a uh, sing-along if we want um, with Buddy the Elf. So if you look at this Taylor Swift last year where she was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year and her concerts, if you read about what she does, she has this profound belief in people. Right, her stories, her songs, and they connect admittedly to largely younger women, but expanding are all about hope and suffering, about personal triumph, her own triumphs, and 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 successes. But she was interviewed, and she says, you know, the reality is, I'm not sexy, I'm not cool. All I do is I open my heart and I work really, really hard. Right? I mean, there's just like something so American about that. But her concerts are this beautiful way of making people belong. There's some evidence that she has done more to help father-daughter relationships than 20 years of therapy in this country. Right? And if you look at her concerts, they're full of fathers and daughters dancing joyously, right? And, and so many dads, as a dad would say, you know, they sing along with their daughter. They either listen to the shows and, and she built this bond of belonging or other people just being friends. But the results are profound. She, any one of her shows had the economic impact on the city of a Super Bowl. You know, Super Bowl are like these crazy economic impact, but she didn't do it once a year. She did it for 50 nights in a row in 20 different cities. 
and generating $4.5 billion of impact. And at one of her shows in Seattle, she had the audience stomping together in unison, right? All this idea of belonging and energy of love. It registered 2.5 on the Richter scale. <laughs> Think about it as an earthquake of 2.5 from stomping together. So Taylor Swift demonstrating the power of living and leading with love. The other is Buddy the Elf. And if you haven't seen the movie or the play Elf, um, it's playing at the Chagrin Little Theater. It's just fantastic. So Buddy the Elf what is a human who climbed into Santa's bag and was taken to the North Pole, was raised by Santa, but then realized he was human and came back to Earth. But his dad was like a businessman and disowned him, didn't want anything to do with him. And Buddy was you know, initially heart, heartbroken, but Buddy believed in the goodness of people. And at his dad's company, he was down in the mail room and got them all rapping and singing together. And everywhere he went, he just infected them. He, he called it Christmas joy rather than love. And his brother, you know, connected with him. And the dad was transformed and had this miraculous moment. He's like, okay, I'm quitting my job. I'm not working with these evil people. I'm going to spread the love. And Santa then flew down to, to come and meet him. But his sleigh crashed in Central Park because his sleigh was powered by Christmas cheer and people were just grumpy in New York. Maybe they're often grumpy in New York and the sleigh crashed, it had no power. So they had to create power. So Buddy the Elf and his girlfriend, Jojo, got started singing you know, a Christmas song. If you may know, know the song, if I had, th I knew you were gonna ask the question, I would have teed it up to play, but that song of let's spread a Christmas song and keep it going the whole year long. And it just cascaded and more people sing and more people sing and people started who were walking in Central Park came and they sang together and they powered Santa's sleigh to take off and leave. And if I could leave you with one, one quote is believe in that power of Christmas cheer or love or whatever the heck you want to call it, but the power that is within and between every one of us, because that is the force for how we're going to change the world. It is the force for going how we're going to solve problems and you are the ones to go do it. So thank you, Monica. Peter, thank you for your insight, your vulnerability, and your incredibly valuable uh, words of wisdom. And uh, I, I have every intent, a belief that you've left all of our participants, which whom I might tell you, you broke the record uh, for attendance for this uh, for for this vitals. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Langell. Thank you, Monica. Dr. Pronovost, thank you for that amazing talk. Your um, passion is infectious. Your impact is clear. Thank you for the great work that you do. It was an absolute honor having you here with us today. It was a joy. Monica, thank you as always for your amazing moderation and insight. And thank you for being part of Vitals. You make Vitals so much more special through your expertise and your brilliant moderation. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I ask that you please join us next year on January 11th as we welcome Jessica Sublett, President and Chief Executive Officer of Bounce Innovation Hub. Jessica will provide insights on accelerating commercialization through collaboration with a special emphasis on its impact in healthcare. Until then, I wish you and your families a happy, healthy, and safe holiday season. Thank you. This is Vitals. Visionary Health Leadership in Action.